it's time for Coffee with the Chicken Ladies, a podcast for people who love chickens. Hey, everybody, and welcome. It's Chrissy and Holly from Coffee with the Chicken Ladies. We're here, and this is episode number 123 of our podcast, where we talk about everything chicken, family, fun, and more chickens. More chickens. We drink a ton of coffee. I'm talking a ton. But most importantly, we hug chickens every day. And we kiss them, too. Don't forget. We brew coffee from a little coffee house in historic Gettysburg, PA, Bantam Coffee Roasters. Holly Ann, what kind of coffee are we brewing today? Mm, Today's brew is Kenyan. It smells absolutely amazing. Has notes of dark chocolate and caramel. You don't get better than that. Nope. And you can buy some, too. Visit BantamRoasters.com. And follow them on Instagram and Facebook. Are you ready to sip some coffee and chat? I am. But first, a word from our sponsor. We have some exciting news to share from our sponsor, Grubbly Farms. This month, you can receive 30% off if you're a first-time buyer. I'm a long-time subscriber, and my flock love the healthy, nutritious treats. Orders $40 and more ship free. If you haven't heard, Grubbly's has a fantastic layer pellet and crumble feed. It's packed with plant and insect protein. It's perfect for those picky chickens and ducks. This offer does not apply to subscriptions and cannot be combined with any other discounts. It's a great time to try Grubbly Farms if you haven't yet. Use the code CWTCL30 for 30% off your first purchase. Try it today. Okay, so how are you doing today? Great. It's April. Things are up in the garden. Our chicks will be here soon. I'm super excited about the chicks coming. Very excited because I'm getting breeds that I've never, ever had before. Mm -hmm, The mm -hmm. girls are excited. We're thinking about names. Yeah, I'm thinking about names too. I'm interested to see your Houdans in case it's a breed that I want to add in the future. I've been interested in them for quite a while and they are such a special breed. They're adorable. And then you have Cochins for the first time. Yeah, I've never had Cochins. I've always wanted them. Big and fluffy. Yes. (laughs) Well, that's why my Cochins and Brahmas and Orpingtons are all together in one big fluffy flock. Yeah. I mean, mine are kind of mixed around, but the big fluffies are going to go in with the uh, Cuckoo Morans and the other big girls. And then Lucy, the Leghorns in there. Tiny little Lucy. Lucy likes it. She has big sisters to cuddle with. Oh, yeah. They keep her warm in the winter. Yeah. I'm thinking about more garden stuff. So... I've been thinking about the runs now. Mm -hmm. I have my wine barrels, which with everything that went on at the end of the year, I didn't get a chance to do. But so this spring, they're going to go. We're going to do all of our plantings there. And I'm thinking about doing mint up the sides of my run. Why not? Because I know there's a spot that the sun comes in constantly. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking about making a natural shade with the mint. Yeah, why not? And I think that it's one of those things that grows super fast, super Mm -hmm. heavy, vine-like. And I think it'll just take off. Well, I use a ton of mine. I'll use it in tea and I'll use it in desserts. And I think you'll find a lot of use for it too. Chickens can nibble it if they want to. Well, I have it everywhere, but there. I love all different kinds of mints. If you're out there and you do the mint thing, you're like me. You can get strawberries and cream mint. You can get pineapple mint. There's chocolate milk mint that I also plant. I have pineapple and I have grown chocolate and I just absolutely love the smell of it. But I haven't had good luck with it staying a long-term perennial. Oh. It's probably just my climate. Mine are coming back and I set up little trellises for them. But I'm thinking the runs could be their own trellis. Absolutely. I would love that whole side of the run to just be covered in mint. So it will repel some bugs Mm -hmm. from the side of the run. The other thing I'm doing that's going to surprise no one is that I'm thinking about ducklings. (laughs) It doesn't surprise me. Not at all. Well, we've both wanted ducks for years. I wanted ducks a long time ago, did the research, and Joe was like, no. And I was like, damn. Well, here's what's going to happen. I will get some ducks, and when they're laying, I will bring duck eggs, and Joe will be charmed by the duck eggs. He will think they're the most delicious thing ever, and you will get ducks too. I don't know about that. I don't know about that. All right. (laughs) Okay, so if you're listening to our show and you're loving it, head on over to Apple Podcast and leave us a written review. It does amazing things for the growth of our show. We have some new reviews this week. Thank you. Thank you so much. We love them. And while you're there, hit that subscribe button. It does amazing things also for the growth of our show. And it's an easy thing to do to help us. If you're looking for other ways to help the podcast, you can tell a chicken loving friend or two about us. Share your favorite episodes on social media. Check out our Etsy shop. We have mugs and t-shirts available there. You can become a patron of the show. Visit patreon.com slash coffee with the chicken ladies. We have a great group of ladies on there with us. 
The other thing you can do to help support the podcast is visit the website, use our affiliate links and discount codes, and buy products from our sponsors. Yay! Hey, Chris. Yeah. Do you like subscription boxes? Does it have anything to do with chickens? Of course. Then yeah. Let me take a minute to tell you about the Chicken Love Box. If you love goodies for your chickens and you, you need to go to chickenlove.com. I love the Mega Box. Tons of useful products for my flock and a chicken tea for me. You can't go wrong with a chicken tea. They are so cute and so soft. In the February box, I absolutely love the red iron rooster trivet and the seed block. I really love that egg timer. It's going to be great when I'm baking. And those chicken stickers are going to be awesome on notes I send out. Boxes start at $39 a month. They ship immediately after your order and shipping is always free. Such a great deal. Don't wait. Get off the nest and click already. Use the code CWTCL50 for 50% off your first box of a three-month subscription or more. That's chickenlove.com. That's chickenluv.com. Get your subscription today. Have you heard of Strong Animals Chicken Essentials? They make natural supplements for your flock. Strong Animals has used plant-based products and natural approaches to promote the health and vitality of backyard flocks. Their products contain organic essential oils, prebiotics, and other natural ingredients to support the immune system and digestive health. Give your chicks and chickens what they need to thrive with Strong Animals health products. Visit GetStrongAnimals.com today. The Breed Spotlight is brought to you by Murray McMurray Hatchery, defining quality for generations. For over a century, Murray McMurray Hatchery has remained a trusted family-owned business, working tirelessly to ensure our poultry meet the highest standards. Whether you are an experienced enthusiast or just embarking on the journey, look to McMurray Hatchery for guaranteed quality rare and heritage breeds, low minimums, and all the supplies you need to raise your flock. Request a free catalog today. Here comes Peter Cottontail, hopping down the bunny trail to give us our breed spotlight for this week. Yeah. Yeah. This week's breed spotlight is the Easter Egger. <laughs> <laughs> the Easter Egger is not a breed. We know that. Easter Eggers are a nice group of chickens. They really are. So what exactly is an Easter Egger? What exactly is it? It's not a true breed. Easter Eggers... Americanas and all of the various other blue-green hued egg layers out there are all carrying genes from the South American Aracana. The ones that have no tails. That's right, the rumpies. But Easter eggers can have very mixed genetics. There have been countless combinations of breeds put together to produce chicken varieties that lay either blue or green eggs. Yes. So if you're curious about the Aracana and the Americana, the Aracana, it is tailless. It has a peak home. It has those ear tufts. The really big ear tufts. And note that in the Aracana, the ear tufts are attached to a lethal gene. The Aracana lays blue eggs. They showed up in the U.S. in the 1920s and 30s, and they were accepted in the American Poultry Association Standard of Perfection in 1976. Let's move on to the Americanas. Americanas. Americanas you identify because they have a tail and a full muffin beard. And they have that peak home. They do have the peak home. I think that's a dominant gene. I think so. I mean, they all have the yeah, home. Yeah, they do. Americanas lay brown or pink eggs, sometimes blue or green eggs. I think they're really more well known to lay the blue and green also. That's what they're more well known for, but they can lay all three. Yeah, they can lay all three. I mean, I think a lot of people get them because they want the blue green. Yes. And of all the Americanas I've ever had, I would say maybe 30% of them laid the blue green. The rest laid brown. All of mine laid blue green. Lucky ducky. Yeah. Now, the Easter Egger. The Easter Egger is a mix of various breeds, as we said, that have been crossed with either Aracana or Americana or a derivative of those breeds that carry the blue egg genes. It's a catch-all phrase. It's where anybody who has come from this gene pool that's not one or the other, Mm -hmm. there's some mix, goes into this category called Easter Eggers. Right. All of the various versions are not recognized as the APA, so they don't have any real breed standard and they can't be shown. But they're so darn popular. I mean, one of the most popular chickens out there. Well, right. They have the pretty eggs. They're generally friendly. I always found mine were a bit shy and jumpy. I've never had an Easter egg. An actual Easter egg. So I don't know personally. I currently still have one. Blanche yeah. Dubois is an Easter egg. Yeah, she's beautiful. And she lays like a misty green egg. It's very pretty. But the Easter egg in general, I think they're usually a nice addition to a backyard flock. Oh, Yes. 
The only thing that I find with that category of chicken, Aracana, Americana, Easter Eggers, I feel like their genetics aren't quite as strong as they need to mm-hmm. be. I feel like they're the ones that a lot of people are coming to us and saying, my chicken's sick. In my own experience, they got sick very easily. Not the hardiest birds. They're not the hardiest birds. Yeah. That's my issue with them. They're beautiful. They have a great personality. Who can deny those muffs, beards? and Oh, they're so cute. They yeah. really are cute. I loved mine. Yeah, I really did too. Now, that Aracana blue egg gene is the key to all of the colored eggs produced by the Easter Eggers. So if you're not familiar with the way egg colors work, a green egg is a blue egg with brown coating. Yep. The shade of green for the egg depends on the shade of brown that's laid by the breed that is bred to the blue egg layer. Say that 10 times fast. I was going to say that's a mouthful right there. That is a mouthful. I'm going to say that again. The shade of green for an egg depends on the shade of brown egg laid by the breed bred to the blue egg layer. In other words, if you have a Moran's that lays a dark brown egg and you breed them to a bird that carries the blue gene, that's a green going over a dark brown egg that gives you the olive egg. Now, do they wear Wranglers? They probably do. (laughs) Did you know where I was going? No, I did not. (laughs) You said blue jeans. Blue (laughs) jeans. I'm clearly a little slow on the draw today. I need more coffee. Well, normally you already know what I'm going to say before I say it. So a light brown coating creates a light green egg. The dark brown gives you the olive color. And I think one of the things when it comes to the genetics that you want to remember is that Easter egg is a variety because they don't breed true. Right. You can use the same parent stock and get Easter eggers, but if you breed two Easter eggers together, you're going to get like a barnyard mix. Right. Yeah. They're going to all look different. There's all different colors. There's not like a set standard that they're going to come by. Now, there are true breeds that lay green and blue eggs, and those hens would not be considered Easter eggers. For example, our favorite, the Crested Cream Leg Bar, the Silver Rods Blue, and the Shetland Hen. All of them are breeds that will breed true that do carry that blue egg gene. It's that old joke. Every Easter egger is a colored egg layer, but every colored egg layer is not an Easter egger. Exactly. Yeah. They're kind of like the mixed breed of the chicken world. When you have mixed breed of the dog world. Like, You're trying to not say the word mutt. <laughs> but they kind of are, but they're special and because like the, they lay a blue green egg. Right. And mutt's a derogatory term. And there's nothing wrong with these chickens. I mean, no. I've had some delightful Easter eggers over the years. They're really nice. I mm-hmm. love them. Generally, with a bird like the Easter egger, you're like, there's no big story behind them. They've just become popular, blah, blah, right. blah, blah, blah. But I uncovered a little bit of information about them. Because you go digging. I, you dig hard. I was digging hard. So the earliest mention I found of the term Easter egg was from Cackle Hatchery. Oh, okay. They actually hold the trademark on the term Easter egg. Really? Yes, they do. I did not know that. No, neither did I. Learn something new all the time. So Cackle has been working on Easter eggers since 1971, and they marketed the birds as laying pink, blue, and green eggs. That's the way I saw them when I first saw Easter eggers. They were marketed with those three colors. I've never seen them marketed with the pink. Really? Never. Okay. So Keckle also states that their particular strain of Easter eggers do have a beard. So they're probably closer to Americanas. Right. Keckle also made an interesting note. And this kind of goes back to what you were saying about the hardiness of this breed. And I'm quoting from the Keckle website. It should be noted that this breed has an inherent genetic beak issue. One out of 100 chicks as they grow may have some variance in severity of scissor beak or cross beak. It doesn't surprise me. Yeah. Also, most Easter egger chickens don't inherit the lethal alleles from their parents, unlike a lot of the Aracana chickens. Okay. So you have one genetic issue, but you lose another genetic issue. When you have certain genetics set up in a heritage breed, they are bred for strong genetics through and through by Mm -hmm. doing the same thing every time. When you are having a group of chickens that are kind of a little this, a little that, it does lend for a little bit of weakening of those genetic Mm -hmm. traits. Mm -hmm. And where it comes in is they may not be just the strongest in being able to deal with something that happens Mm -hmm. to them. That's what I found with my Americanas. They're not Easter eggers, but they're in the same family. Mm -hmm. Now, Easter eggers do tend to be pretty good layers. They're really good layers. Mm -hmm. 200 plus a year. That's in my really good category. Yeah. I mean, it can vary a bit based on their genetics, but in general, I always found mine to be pretty good layers. And they have a bantam version. So if you How want cute little is ones, that? I know. The bantams are the cutest things ever. They really are. For sure. Love a tiny chicken. And they're widely available. So if you want the originals, go to Cackle. Right. 
there are two things I think that have led to their incredible popularity. The first is the egg color. Oh, yes. And the second is that wide availability because you can find them pretty much everywhere. And like, there's always people breeding them, I feel like. Yeah. I mean, just about every hatchery and every feed store out there will carry Easter eggers. Went into Tractor Supply the other day to look at their neat chicken lady stuff in there. Yeah. And the chicks were in there and they had Easter eggers, pullets. Oh, my Tractor Supply had ducklings. Oh, boy. You oh, have yeah. ducks on the brain. I really do. They are pretty beginner friendly. You I know, think they are too. They're a good family bird, for they sure. Are. They're pretty gentle. One thing I will note about mine over the years they will wander far and wide if you don't watch them, and they are not always predator savvy. They're just kind of like, la dee dee. They are. Let me look at this flower. This is so beautiful. But there might be worms further over there. Yeah. So you have to really keep a close eye on them, mm-hmm. keep them close to you. This is why we always talk about supervised free ranging. That's what we do. We recommend that you keep them in a big run, the biggest one that mm-hmm. you can so that they can have some freedom. And then when you have the time to be out free ranging with them, you're there. Some of them will fly. Oh, yeah, because they're little. I'll tell you a little anecdote about our very first set of Americanas. My sister drove this Jeep that had a sunroof, and she would park it in the driveway at the farm Mm -hmm. with the sunroof open. And we couldn't find, was the darker of the two Americanas, and I cannot remember her name to save my life, but she would fly up to the Jeep and she would hop inside and she would lay her eggs in the console. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. Yeah. So you'd find a green egg in the console. (laughs) It's so funny. I kind of have a similar story. I had the Americanas. I had Pearl, which was my beloved. I loved her. Mm -hmm. She's pretty. Yeah. And she lived with us. She was almost like a house chicken for a little while. She was so far at the bottom of the pecking order and so meek that they pushed her out of the flock. Mm -hmm. So then she became part of our flock. In my neighborhood, it's big to drive golf carts around from house to house. You know this. You've Mm -hmm. seen it. So we would take her for walks around the neighborhood and let her walk around and we'd be talking to the neighbors and one of our neighbors sitting in his golf cart as we're talking to him and she's walking around and next thing I know, she jumps up on his lap and then stands on the steering wheel. (laughs) (laughs) Just sitting there like... She's like, come on. Let's go. Take a ride. Let's go. Yeah. So they have some really cool personalities. They do. They do. They're one of those you can't go wrong. You don't know what color egg you're going to get. So that's kind of like a little grab bag there. And they're going to need some extra help because of the weakening of the genetics. But just be prepared for it. I was pondering the question whether an olive egg is an Easter egg. And I do think they're a bit separate and a little bit more specialized. I believe so too. Even though they're another colored egg laying variety and not a breed. They are, but the olive egg generally takes from the same breeds every time Mm -hmm. to get that dark green egg versus... Well, there's only a handful of dark brown egg layers that you can use for the olive egg genetics. Yeah. Yeah. So... We want you guys to flood our Instagram this week with your pictures of your Easter eggers. Because what's cuter than these Easter eggers with their beard, their muffs, their pea combs? Although not all of them have the beard and muff. Flood yeah. us over with those pictures. I'll give you a story on Instagram. We would love to see them. We can put my Blanche up. She's a gorgeous bird, but she does not have muff or beard. I thought she did. No, she doesn't. Okay. You're probably thinking of Carmelita. Maybe. Yeah. So yeah, send us over your pictures. We would love to see them. If you're looking for a chicken coop that's produced in a planet-friendly, sustainable way, try Nestera. Each coop is made from highly durable, 100% recycled plastic that keeps the equivalent of up to 2,000 shampoo bottles out of a landfill. Their clean, modern design will fit into any garden or run area and comes with an industry-beating 25-year warranty and a range of handy accessories. Simple to put together, so quick and easy to clean, and most importantly, red mite resistant. Your chickens will love it. Quick shipping from Amazon.com or Nestera.us. For a 5% discount, use the affiliate link in our show notes, on our website, and on Instagram. Link in bio. Check them out today. Roosties proudly sponsors Coffee with the Chicken Ladies. We personally use Roosties products with our chickens and we're huge fans. They have their awesome nesting pads, do-it-yourself feeder and waterer kits, and they've just released their best product ever, a new chick feeder and waterer set. They have adjustable legs to keep food and water clean. They're super well made and the feeder even has a removable lid so it can easily be filled from the top. So if you're raising chicks or keeping chickens, all their products are available for prime delivery on Amazon.com. Check out the Roosty store on Amazon or follow the link in our show notes. Okay, it's about that time for main topic. Yeah. Yeah. It's Easter week. That's right. And we wanted to keep things really light and we met somebody that we were really impressed with, super excited to meet. This is Madeline, and she is the owner and head designer over at Lenora Dame Jewelry. This stuff is amazing to be wearing on Easter Sunday, let me tell you. She's a super fun chicken lady. 
She's a chicken lady and owner of a company and a head designer for jewelry. Mm -hmm. So she's got it all going for her. So we're going to bring you this interview now. Enjoy. Welcome to the show. So nice to meet you. So nice to be here. Thank you so much for having me. Our pleasure. So can you tell us who is Lenora Dame? Lenora Dame is my mom. She's a very incredibly creative and artistic person who had quite the vision early on. She originally was an art history major. She was a lover of all things old. Anything that had a story, anything that was off the regular path that you would go. I was the only one of my friends that would spend spring break going antiquing with my mom. That was something that I kind of grew up doing. We both did too. Uh, When I met my husband, he's like, do you have anything that is kind of new? Um, Why would you? (laughs) Vintage is best. Yeah, (laughs) exactly. But she originally was in the advertising world, kick and butt. But then she settled down with my dad and had my brother and I. And she was looking for something to do. And she started using this vintage button collection that she had to make earrings and necklaces and jewelry boxes. We were in Chestnut Hill, which is a suburb of Philadelphia. So she started making friends in the area. And one of her best friends at the time was a buyer of a tiny little store at the time called Anthropology. That was actually the original store was in Wayne, Pennsylvania, which was in a converted, very industrial, you know, exactly what you would expect. And it had a working fountain in the middle of it, which I, you know, at three years old was trying to hurl myself into any chance I could get. And she was just looking for someone to sort of fill the gap of this new store that she was buying for. And back then it was still Glenn Zank that was there, who you probably know from Man Shops Globe. And he's a real visionary in that world and sort of in a lot of ways, retail king. Well, at that time he was just Uncle Glenn. And we had no idea what was on the horizon for us. But my mom started getting more and more orders. And to this day, we still not as much as we used to. It's a very different corporate environment over at Anthro now. I worked there for 10 years, starting as an intern. And then through my years of Drexel, I went there for fashion design and merchandising. So that was my co-op. It's one Um, of my favorite stores. Like I have clothes from there and instantly people know like the style is somewhat different. And right. you know, I'm talking about my pants I wear all the time. And everybody's like, I love those pants. And I'm like, anthropology. I, like, I it, love a good kooky pair of pants. Exactly. Uh-huh. Like, you know what you're going to get. And that's why her jewelry fit right in with what they were doing. Yeah. My mom is still very close with a lot of high up people there. They too did not realize the length that this corporation would have gone. And I think that seeing my mom's jewelry definitely, well, our jewelry now as I'm an owner and I'm the head designer now. It really evokes a feeling of anthropology, whether it's early anthropology or now. Um, 100%. I see it. Like I said, when I'm in that store, it's just a perfect match. Definitely. We've never been terribly trend driven. You know, we're just kind of the kookier, the better, the more handmade, the better. Anything that kind of makes you smile. I find huge inspiration in prints and textiles, which Mm. above all, my mom is a collector. If you were to walk around our office you would die at how much, forgive me, but crap is in here. It's just like, good God. And that's why anytime we've even thought of moving to a new place, it's like, I'm not doing it, are you? Kind of thing. But we have a whole side of a room that's dedicated to just our fabrics and prints. So a lot of times we'll start there or we'll start. I went through Drexel, which makes you do a year of fundamental art before you start anything in your major. So you end up being an artist whether you want to be or not. And so I've been lucky enough to add in my own illustrations, my own findings, my own touch on things. But it is wild because a lot of the women that now work for me, we're all women own and run. Everybody here is a mom. And it's almost like a co-op in a lot of ways because we really help each other. And as long as the work is getting done, there's no problem, you know, with schedule and all of that. Isn't it crazy that sometimes women together in our communication style, even in business, we can change this world in so many ways because women together work so well together. I think it's this misconception that women are at each other's throats all the time. Oh, no. No. Always found, whatever I was working on at the time, a team of women, we all found the cooperator part of ourselves. Oh, yeah. And it's so nice because, unfortunately, we did have some tragic things happen that led to me being the owner. 
my mom's business partner, who was her sister and my aunt did have a stroke. And she wasn't able to be on the business side of things. And my dad is fighting a disease called multiple system atrophy, okay. which is basically Parkinson's and MS and mm-hmm. every bad thing possible combined. Right. Oh, so sorry. We're so sorry to hear that. Uh, thank you. But my husband and I and my kids, luckily, we live on the property with them across the driveway. So we take care of them and the chickens and Which anyone brings- else who shows up. Most people through COVID, they had to readjust things. And so we mostly transit, you know, we used to be a full blown wholesale, like going to trade shows, which I've been going to since I was in a baby Bjorn on my mom's test. And I really take for granted the fact that there are these big people in the fashion industry that I have spit up on at one point. You know what I mean? Like It's really funny now that I'm running the company. There are women here that technically work for me that have known me since I was 12 years old. Wow. And one of my designers is actually, she's in her 60s and she's incredibly talented and has grandchildren and she's just like an aunt to me. It's wild. I was very nervous about taking on that sort of managerial position in terms of being in charge of people that I think have much more authority than I do. But because we all work so well together and we're so good at communicating and we're so good at just picking up slack if someone needs it, it was a really seamless transition. I couldn't be happier with who I work with. Everyone is respectful. You know, we've never had a problem. It's pretty amazing. I love your use of portrait, like cameo lockets in your jewelry. Oh, yeah. I'm an Italian girl who my mother and my great grandmother were all about the Italian cameos and different yeah. things. So when I see that, other than the chicken stuff, all your designs are just absolutely breathtaking and beautiful. It doesn't matter. Chickens, so sheep, farm animals, dogs, cats. And I love your fabric use. I am a fiber artist. Oh my gosh. Um, yeah, so yeah. I'm a shepherd and a spinner and a weaver. And so oh, wow. I think Chrissy and I came at the jewelry from different sides. Right. But we both absolutely love everything about it. And then you have I a chicken. I always start with textiles. The problem with creativity is that it flows when it flows. You cannot force it. If I'm ever feeling like I just don't even know where to start, I go over to my fabrics and it always sparks that creativity. There's nothing more beautiful. And I think in another life, I would have gone more into the textile side of things. It's a slippery slope. It is. I just commend you and everyone over there, Lenora Dane, because one piece is just more beautiful than the next piece. And we're both eclectic Mm -hmm. and we're both our own women. We know what we like. And that's what we like about the jewelry. We came to it from different directions. Now, the one thing we have to ask you about, how did the chickens come to be a part of your inspiration? (laughs) (laughs) Well, it's actually funny because during COVID, we were all very bored and we essentially just redid both houses. We're in a converted pool house that has just grown and grown and grown as my kids get rammer and rammer and destroy (laughs) more and more things. The construction went on for almost three years before we were really moved in and we really made the place our own. And then COVID hit. And we were all sort of trying to find stuff to do just to make our homestead more and more homey where we didn't have to leave. My husband is Irish Catholic, grew up in Roxborough in Philadelphia. He's actually an actor and no one was doing any acting work. Yeah, right. And he was supposed to be in a play, which is truly where he shines. All of his stage work. I fall in love with him every time I see him on stage again. Nice. But he's also now the most kick-ass stay-at-home dad. He grew up in the city environment. So when he married me, I'm kind of this farm girl. We weren't beach people. We went to Montana in the summers and it was very much immerse yourself in nature, but make it work for you as well. Mm -hmm. So gardening, all those kinds of things. And my husband just threw himself into it and realized that he loves it. And so we sort of said, okay, well, why stop there? And we built this beautiful coop that goes with our modern aesthetic. We Um, know where this is going to (laughs) go. And he just fell in love with it. And now the chickens follow him around and they love when he comes over. And if he walks past the coop, you just hear this flurry of them because they're all in love with him. And he, you know, slowly started calling them his girls. And during this time of COVID, we were raising these chicks. We got them when they were tiny and my boys absolutely loved them. Nice. 
we got a dog or two. I talked him into getting another one, but our family of pets just got bigger and bigger. And something we were always fussing around was chickens. And so during the COVID time, I'm like, we have to add a chicken necklace whatever we can into the collection because a lot of the stuff you see being added to the collection during the time of COVID is just stuff that was on my brain that I was obsessing okay. over with my family at home. And so I'm like, you know, this is the chicken period of our lives. Well, that's how we found you because yeah. your chicken jewelry beyond compare. Love it. <laughs> our listeners, they can't see us right now, but Holly is wearing the Lenora Dame earrings that I bought her for oh, Christmas this year. So good. Beautiful leghorns on the end of them. I love yeah. them. I yeah. also got her the purse charm um, oh, good. for Christmas too. And when you have chickens and chickens are a passion, you live and breathe what your passion is, right? So right. you wear chicken shirts, you have chicken purses, oh, yeah. you wear chicken jewelry. Your house is filled with chickens. Your house, oh, our yeah. recording studio is full of chickens. Oh yeah. So we were looking, we were like, oh my God, this is eclectic. It's vintage. The other thing that we haven't mentioned yet is you use recycled yes. material, which it's green, you know? So we're saving yes. the earth back. We're using it as yeah. jewelry. And it's an all win situation here at Lenora Dame. And I have right now on my iPad, the chicken bantam necklace, just because yeah. while we're talking, I like to look at it. And oh my God, gorgeous. It's so fun. That's sort of what we go for is that it makes you smile. It's really fun. It's a small snippet of, you know, our kids go to a co-op school, which makes Montessori look like a military school. <laughs> uh, they have cooking days at school where oh. parents will bring in, you know, their eggs and they'll make a quiche all together or something. Nice. You know, it really is the self-sustaining community. Their school is flushed to a green farm that has sheep and cattle. And wow. they regularly get into the schoolyard and the kids have to like get them out all together. Because my husband missed the community of living in the city, I myself was kind of trying to give him as much community as, you know, he's like the mayor. I could be in a room all by myself and be content. But Dan is like, I got to talk to everyone. I got to hear everyone's story. And he really missed that moving out here. But now we have found this other community that circles around, you know, agriculture and self-sustaining and animals and just taking care of each other. And it's really the way I want to live and raise my children. And I'm not at all surprised that that trickled into my professional world because it's all family owned. It's all mom ran. If I text them and say, you know, oh, my God, I can't come into work today because a tree fell on our coop. It's it like, happened to me this summer. Yeah. Yep. Oh my God. Yeah. The storms. But it's just, you know, all hands on deck. Everyone helps each other. We're all going through the same thing. And it's really a sweet little spot that we have built for ourselves. It's amazing. When we contacted you to set up the interview, we did not know that you had chickens. We also didn't know that you, <laughs> you made our day. <laughs> you grew up with chickens. Do you remember any of the breeds you had when you were a kid? They were mostly just your standard Rhode Island Reds. We didn't have any silkies or you know orpingtons or anything interesting like that they were just your classic chickens chickens like you said they bring about a community everyone gets together this is how the podcast started two and a half years ago is that need for a place to go to talk about chickens oh yeah so it brings people together that's for sure my boys love it, whether it was building the coop or going out to check for eggs, which is like a treasure hunt. Or, Every day. And we're actually going to be adding a couple ducks to our flock as well. Um, oh, what kind of ducks? I forget what they were called. This was my husband's idea because my youngest, Jack, wants a duck more than anything in the world. <laughs> oh. And we did hear that they're good companions for chickens and our coop is pretty big. But even getting ducks makes me nervous because mm -hmm. it's going to get so attached to it. And I worry. Jack is like, I really want to bring him in the tub with me. You know, he's already like planning <laughs> his whole life with this duck. Did your boys help you pick out the breeds you're getting this year? Yes. So what did you pick? So we are getting silkies, of course. We did have two silkies a couple of years ago. And unfortunately, they were, we think, killed by a fox. Oh, no. Um, but they were hilarious, but also like little rage monsters. They were just <laughs> like rushing at the kids nonstop. And we're definitely going to get a lavender Orpington. I have a lavender Orpington. Oh, you do? Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then we're going to get a sorted Polish, Americana, Olive Egger, Speckled Sussex, and Delaware. 
Wow. You're getting all our breeds, basically. All of our favorite. Oh my gosh. <laughs> yes. That's awesome. So I'm pretty psyched that this year I'm getting three Houdans, which are in the Polish family, basically. Okay. Big poofy crests. Yeah, and, I you know, I, my loves with the Orpingtons. And we so, both have speckled Sussex and we both have Heritage Delaware. You know, you got a really, have, yeah. really nice mix of birds right there. Yeah. We've said this before. Everyone kind of wants a silky because they're like the ultimate breed, but they're very tough for beginners because yeah. they can have a lot of health problems. Mm -hmm. They aren't really a normal chicken. They're more like on the wayside of pet chickens versus yeah. being outside and in a flock. So yeah. they can be a little bit more challenging, but it sounds like you're going to be great. We're and super it's excited, especially I've heard about lavender Orpingtons being really good ones. Our first chickens many, many years ago were Orpingtons. So we started with Buff and then I went to Lavenders. And now yeah. Holly and I both on our separate farms have the Jubilee Orpingtons. You know, they're spotted. They're just they're gorgeous. And our speckled stunning. Sussex, you can't go wrong with any of the breeds that mm -hmm. you picked. Nice. Breeds. And now you know us. So you got us here. Yeah, <laughs> you know, so if you need exactly. any help whatsoever. We're um, around. We were around and we're within an hour and a half probably drive of you. So I know I was so wild how close we're we gonna are. have to meet for coffee one day. That is a yes, I would love that. That would be so <laughs> much fun. So you told us that the upcoming collection is gonna yeah. have some new chicken stuff. Can you tell us it more is. about it? So my husband takes care of all the big farm stuff in our house, you know. Mm -hmm. And it's funny that you said once you have one, you just keep collecting them because I have a handbag fetish and my husband's like, hon, these chickens, they're not handbags. You can't just, oh, I'm getting another one this weekend. You know, Why kind not? Of, exactly. Because I'm that way with dogs too. And now <laughs> we have two dogs in a 500 square foot house. And <laughs> one of them is a corgi golden retriever mix. Oh my. Um, so he's very long, but very short. I mean, delivery people that come to our house will literally say, oh my God, what is that thing? His nickname is Stumpy. Which, I love it. Yeah, we love him. Ah, but he is it. one of those dogs that you look at and you're like, something's not right. Like, why are his feet? <laughs> <laughs> but you know what? Oh these things in life tie Ooh. back to your creativity and making right. these amazing pieces. And the joy. You have to have a sense of humor with everything that you do. And we yeah. love that our jewelry, you know, is funny. <laughs> I love wearing something that someone comes up to me yeah. about and says, I love that. That's so unique. Where did right. you get it? And it just shows your personality every piece. I mean, you even had one out for President's Day that had the glue cameo oh. and everything. Oh, that's pretty. It was really pretty. And did you guys see the family vacation one? I found all these, actually a very old Life magazine article that had these family vacations, like women with big rollers in their hair with a oh, big yeah. And I put it under lenses and I'll send you a picture of it. It's very goofy. It's very like wonder years, you know, women Love it. smoking cigarettes on a cruise ship kind of thing. I'm the kind of person that I like to switch something that's that eccentric up. We went to a gala for a local ballet this weekend and I'm looking through my pieces like, hmm, mm -hmm. what can I wear with, you know, an evening dress that's going to throw some attention right. to it? Now, I asked my husband to get me a, the necklace for Christmas, but he did not come through on that. So I did not have the chicken necklace to wear, which wow. I would have yeah. definitely have worn. You guys some chicken swag. We would love it. It's what brings you joy. And that's what we talk about with the chicken lady life. It doesn't always have to be overalls on the farm. You can be out there with some really cool pieces of jewelry oh, yeah. on, some cool pants. It's all a state of mind and it makes you happy. It's not weird anymore. When I was doing a little bit of background research on the company, what kept coming up was some magazine entries. It might have been some of the first press conference the company got. And it was all centered on these dinosaur necklaces. Yes. And let me point out that the chicken is the closest living relative of the T-Rex. So exactly. we're back to chickens already. We're back but, to chickens. But, no. but it was this dinosaur necklace that people love so much that really put Lenora Dame in the public eye. Yes. That was an anthro for a long time because the statement necklace was such a thing that people really loved in like 2009, 2010. I mean, the other day I was rewatching Gossip Girl and I was like, oh my God, that's definitely an old Lenora Dame necklace. And it's funny because it's always unexpected and it's always this like goofy kind of thing that you wouldn't expect to be on, you know, Serena Vanderwoodson, but there it is. Like you said, 2010, 2009, in that era, the statement necklace came back in hard. 
and oh, it was yeah. like it's back in again that now i feel like it, the, the yeah. circle is back around to yeah. the statement necklace and here's the thing i want to do with the statement necklace make it never go out just make it a staple because yeah. you can get a dress or something that looks fantastic on you and not worry about a print a black dress a solid dress and you can put a statement necklace bracelet yep. earrings with it and make the whole thing without taking away from your clothing looking on you the best way that it can what is it like to see Lenore Dame designs, you know, at Fashion Week or on TV or something like that? What does that feel like? It's funny because I saw it as a young fashion student who was very trend driven. You know, I had the stupid bangs. I had the quirky glasses, you name it. And I was spending a lot of time in New York then. I was living in the city then. And I hated my mom's jewelry. This is so not on trend. This is like old lady necklace. You know, I was just like not into it. And I would go to the trade shows because you would get to walk around and see what was in. Yeah. And I loved getting dressed up for the trade shows. Yeah. And, you know, I was the only kid at the time that was taken off high school for like three days every January to go to a trade show. That's awesome. Um, Mm -hmm. Yeah, I loved it. But now that I'm older, I'm now 33 and I really established my own style, which does include comfort items like possibly the undershirt I slept in with just the sweater on top of it. Right? Ah. There's ways to express your style that still work within your life. Yeah. And that's sort of what brought me to getting tired of trends because it's something you're trying to infuse into your life that is not there to stay. It's something someone's telling you to go towards. You're in that age group. We're a little past you. So we're a little bit more even voicing about it. Right. But when you come to who you are yes. and you embrace it and you know what? No trend. None of them matter. It's no. all about just being no. you and what makes you happy. If it's not yeah, an organic, it's all about comfort. It really it is. is. Exactly. If yeah. it's not an organic, and I mean organic with a small o, if it's not an organic part of you, then it's yeah. sort of valueless. We just did this reel the other day, which I used the clip because it resonated so deeply with me. And it says, I don't have to be likable. I just have to be me. And then the right people gravitate to me. And that message is it in a nutshell. Like you're just going to be you. And you know what? The right people are going to find you and love you for who you are. Oh yeah. This is what your jewelry, that's the message to me I get from your jewelry is be yourself. Through this takeover that I've been doing, and it includes building a new website, all of this is we're kind of trying to create this new byline for us because it used to be our old website used to have these kind of taglines that were kind of going all over the place. And something that I've learned in appreciating my mom's talent, her eye, her creativity, but her confidence in what she knows will work, what she knows looks good, what she knows looks expensive and handmade and thought out. Yes. Mm -hmm. We've sort of come up with this new embracing the future without forgetting your past. I love it. That's kind of our new mantra. I would say something I really like about myself is that I'm a really quick decision maker. If I like something, I'm immediately like, I know that's what I want. I know it's going to work. And even if it's the wrong decision, you live with it and you figure it out later. Right. Exactly. Life is all about trying things out. Yeah. And finding you in all of it. Trying to gather. Yeah. Yeah. And through being a collector of all of these antique things and wonderful vintage treasures and found objects, you're collecting experiences that way. And that's how you're creating your person that you're going to be or who you are. Figuring it out is solving all these mysteries or making decisions or collecting these things. And then you eventually land where you're supposed to land. And the crazy chicken lady is no trend anymore. It's just a way of being. That's right. And it's a way of life that is fun, can have a slight glam. You can be in the dirt. You can be whatever you want. Oh, yeah. There are so many of us and we really have each other's backs. Yeah. I love that your company is all women worked, women driven. I know. I love that you're supporting the glam chicken because I'm the kind (laughs) of person that I'll wear like like my vintage white overalls to farm outside with like a cute crop top under it. Of course. And I think I look like absolute crap and then I have no filter. So then I go to the grocery store and someone's like, I love your tie dye overalls. And I'm like, that's dirt. But awesome. It's yeah. Awesome. You know, sometimes I'm glam, sometimes I'm not because yeah. with sheep farming, sheep farming is a little more intense. I had to go to the pharmacy one day and my pharmacy is like right in the middle of, you know, country. My whole neighborhood is agricultural. Mm-hmm. So I ran down to the pharmacy and I'm in line and it was winter. So I had on like 
hugger pants, my barn boots. Mm-hmm. I had on a big nappy pullover and I had a hand knitted hat on that was sort of slouchy on one side. And, you know, the pharmacist, they see me all the time. But apparently the man behind me was very shocked. So I say goodbye to the pharmacist checking me out and I go to leave. And I heard him say, well, welcome to the neighborhood, sir. And I just laughed all the way out the door. We know what it's about. It's about being secure in your own self, being true to yourself. Nothing works if you're not true to yourself. Being able to laugh at yourself. Yeah. I I laugh at myself every day. Yeah, I know. So my husband and I met and dated for 40 days before we got married. Sometimes you know. Sometimes yeah. you just know. Yeah. And that's not crazy to me if you just know, it, you know. Yeah. I mean, it's funny because my parents were like wringing their hands, but my grandparents were like, what? That's how we did it. And, I you mean, know, it was the easiest decision I've ever made. But one of the things is he laughs at me more than any human being does. And he taught me <laughs> to really laugh at myself. I think laughter is the best medicine. Oh, yeah. I always bring up the story when we first started recording and we did our New Year's resolutions. And mine was a laugh more. And everyone listening knows that Holly and I, we've been best friends for 40 years. Oh, that's And so we were little kids. Yeah. We were little kids. Yeah. She looks at me and says, don't you laugh enough? I think you yeah. laugh enough. <laughs> but see, I'm the dry one. So, and yeah. then she says, hers <laughs> is going to drink more coffee. And I looked at her and I said, don't you drink enough coffee already? Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> well, that's good because if you pick resolutions that you're kind of already doing. It's right? easy. <laughs> it's in success. It's true. <laughs> If you're sitting with your phone right now, look it up. We always say this and look at what we're talking about because you're going to get a feel for the stuff and you're going to feel the same way that we do about it. I guarantee you. Because we are hardcore vintage shoppers, I'm on eBay and Etsy and Mercari a lot. And I've got to tell you, those early Lenore Dame pieces, wowie, highly collectible, and they will sell for a pretty penny. I know. And a lot of times people establish it with vintage anthropology. It's crazy that there's vintage anthropology at this point. That's crazy. A lot of times people will message us saying, where can I find your stuff at Anthro? I don't know who to even call because it's so corporate now. Everyone listening to us right now, you know where to go. We're going to have the links directly in our show notes to take you where you need to go. The way we found you in the very initial beginning, we do all of our brainstorming for a retail therapy and we go on Etsy and we start looking and I was like, you got to pull this up on your computer right now. And but not just chickens, chicken, sheep, llama, everything. Dogs, birds. Oh, yeah. I think the first all time we it. talked about your Etsy store is it's a mini vacation. When you go there, you just <laughs> yeah. can take a break from every day and look at the pretty jewelry, the eccentric jewelry that is so beautiful. You know, we're going to ask you a question that we ask everyone, and this one's not going to be easy. What breeds are your favorite? We're obviously going to add a bunch of new ones, but I've grown up with Rhode Island Reds, and they're just such the classic chicken. Such a boring answer, but no, it's not really no. count on that. And they're nice. They're easy you to deal with. I mean, Rhode Island Reds are like the straight leg black t-shirt of the yes. chicken world. They really yes. are. I mean, they are just a consummate classic American chicken. I have one Rhode Island the- Red and her name's Spicy. <laughs> and she is amazing. She always wants to be in the camera, in my face, in my lap, loving on me. You well, know, we have so a really amazing. funny one. I'll be sitting out on our patio, usually on my computer doing something. And I'll look over and I'm like, I can't tell if that chicken is in the coop or out. There's one Rhode Island red that just escapes every chance. And then she gets caught. I'll be like, oh, no, get. And she goes right back in. Oh, yeah. My spicy. I'm always laughing at her. She's in so many of our videos on social media because she wants to be. She's very nosy. She wants to be. And we had the funniest story. I went away and Holly had to come check. Cornelia had. Uh, One of the girls had just started laying and she was having a little bit of a prolapse. prolapse Yeah. So I drove over here to check while I was out of town. And, you know, Cornelia was right in front of me in the run. So I come in and I kind of squat down and look. And I realized that the red line of red is right there with me, head tilted the same way, looking. They're so good. What are we checking out? What you looking at? (laughs) It's a chicken butt. Okay, so we just want to thank Madeline for coming in and talking to us. This has been so much fun, so amazing, learning about Lenora Dame and the company. And I'm telling you, everybody right now, as you're listening, Google this or go to our show notes and just hit the link. We'll take you right where you need to go and have a few minute vacation just looking at this really beautiful eccentric jewelry that is going to take you to a place where you feel like you, you feel different. You feel who you are just by wearing a necklace, a bracelet, a purse charm, earrings, 
Trust me. Trust, trust both of us. You're going to love it. In there that will make well, you Well, also, smile. I would love to mention that a lot of our work is custom work. Okay. Uh, and a lot of people send us pictures of their beloved pets. We actually had a woman send in all of the women and her family wanted to be on one necklace. It was nice, like beautiful old portraits that we put under lenses and then made a homemade jade bead chain for it. And she absolutely loved it. We do wholesale. So any kind of stores or anything, uh, we do a lot of product development. Um, and just, you know, we've had anything from Oh my gosh, my dog just passed away and I want him on a keychain. Can you please make this for it? We do all of that. That's wow. amazing. Yeah, we I mean, I um I totally get it because I was a before I was a chicken lady, I was a crazy springer spaniel lady. Um and lost my Matilda a couple of years ago, but um I put her on a necklace. You know, oh. it's those kind of things that, you know, you can really put your exact image that you want and we can do anything with it um, and like i said amazing. this is gonna make your day just by looking at the jewelry it's gonna make you happy madeline do you ever do anything with feathers oh yeah we okay. can do anything and if we don't have it in house we'll figure it out because i'm kind of a macgyver that way i, I really <laughs> if i can't figure it out i'll figure out how to figure it out awesome. so that's perfect um, i love you know i through Drexel, I had to do all these installation art classes and things mm -hmm. like that, which, oh my God, and never in a million years would I guess that uh, that was something I was going to do, but really teaches you to open a closet and say like, what can I do with all this junk That's in awesome. front of me? That's, That's awesome. a real skill. Really That's really fantastic. Fun. But thank you. Um, thank you again yeah. for coming on. And listeners, go to our show notes, check it out. You will not be disappointed until I'm sure you're going to come back on the show at some time soon. Well, I was just about to say that as soon as we come up with new chicken stuff, I'll let you know, you'll be some of the first to know so that we can maybe tell your listeners all about it so they can get first dibs before. That would be amazing. Oh, absolutely. Chicken lady <laughs> exclusives. Yes. That's fantastic. We'll talk to you later. Thanks, Madeline. No, thank you. Bye. We just want to thank Madeline one more time for coming and spending a really fun hour with us. And we look forward to seeing some more chicken designs in the future. Oh my gosh, that was such a fun interview. I had such a great time. Okay, so let's move on to... Ch -ch 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 -ch. Cracking the eggs. Cracking those eggs. Today, we're going with something that you can put on your buffet, your brunch table for Easter because it's our Easter extravaganza. Alongside those chive and cheddar biscuits from last week. We've been setting up for this Easter brunch, man. Mm -hmm. You know you're going to be ready. So this week we're doing savory asparagus and shrimp clafouti because you know we love that clafouti. Clafouti is absolutely delicious. It's fun to say. I took it to some friend's house who had never had it before a Do few the, weeks the, ago. The cherry chocolate clafouti. It's good. They loved it. And, you know, it's just a great recipe. And we did serve a little whipped cream on top and mm -hmm. it went really, really well. So let's go with the savory side. And here's the thing. The clefouti is going to give you a nice hostess dish to take to your Bacon family's take. house on yeah. Easter or add to your own Easter brunch or just Sunday or whenever. And you only need four eggs. That's right. And they have to be at room temperature. Let's just put it this way. Baking with eggs really all need to be at room temperature. For the most part, they really do. Do you want to take us through the ingredients? Uh, let's just do the ingredients quickly. So you're going to need a third a cup of butter or dairy-free alternative. We do use Earth Balance. It's kind of mainstream. You can find it everywhere. Yeah. Melted and cooled, plus extra to butter the dish. Now, buttering the dish, I'm going to tell you this, really important because you're going to serve it and you want to get it out. Of the I dish. have occasionally sprayed the dish with olive oil spray if I, think I was it, short of butter, and it works pretty well. Yeah. A cup of all-purpose flour. We like to use Bob's Red Milk, gluten-free, one-to-one. A cup of milk or plant milk. Three quarters of a teaspoon of salt or sea salt. A half a teaspoon white pepper teaspoon of dried dill or a tablespoon of fresh dill. I love dill with eggs. Mm -hmm. It's really, Add really shrimp. good. Snipped or chopped. And two tablespoons of the chives. You can snip them off and chop them with scissors or your yeah. knife, whatever. I am a full lover of asparagus. So a bunch of asparagus spears. And you're going to snap them first and then chop them up. About two inch pieces. Mm -hmm. And then two cups of pre-cooked shrimp. Because you're not cooking those shrimp in the eggs. With the tails removed because that texture would totally ruin the Oh dish. my God. Can you imagine <laughs> if the little tails were hanging out the no, top? That would be so no, crazy. Thank you. You're going to heat the oven to 400. Put your eggs in a mixing bowl and you're going to whisk them. You can use a hand mixer for this if you want to. I just use my whisk. I just use a whisk. And I liked it with the sugar because it does really kind of make a consistency that's kind of frothy. Mm -hmm. It's kind yeah, of yeah. satisfying that the girls always say this. It's satisfying to it's watch this. Yeah. 
Beat the eggs with the whisk until they're starting to get to that frothy stage. You're going to very slowly add that melted butter and just keep whisking. Yep. Keep whisking as you pour that butter exactly. in. Exactly. You're going to add your flour, salt, pepper, dill, and chives, and you're going to whisk that until the batter is completely combined. And then you're going to add the milk. A bit at a time. I think I'd probably do it in three editions. Yeah. And the batter is going to become sort of smooth and thick. Right. And this batter is the same as our other recipe for clafouti. Clafouti is the same. Where we're going to get different is the ingredients. This one has one more egg than the sweet does. Yeah. But it ends up being pretty close in consistency. You can use a ceramic bacon dish. You can use a large cake pan. You can use a pie dish or even an oven safe skillet. I love the Pioneer Woman's pie dishes, especially to take. Mm -hmm. They're so pretty. They're really, really nice. I have a vintage Corningware pie dish, and it's all white and has the corn flowers in the middle of it. Oh, nice. That's my favorite one for clafouti and egg custard. I have both the Pioneer Woman ones, the regular and the deep dish, Mm -hmm. and I love them. Yeah. It's good to have a couple deep dish around. Yeah. So just like you would do with a sweet clafouti, you're going to put the shrimp and the asparagus in the bottom of the pan, mm-hmm. and then you're going to pour the batter over top. Right. Try not to send all the shrimp to one side. You know, try to keep it even. Now, we'll say this. We have for this recipe to bake for 30 to 35 minutes. Now, when you go gluten dairy-free and you go dairy, mm-hmm. there's going to be a time difference. Yep, they can cook differently. So we both did it. Holly Ann's was gluten and dairy-free, and mine had dairy. It took me about 45 minutes to bake mine. Okay. So there's a little discrepancy. What you have to do is keep looking at it after 30, 35 minutes, every five minutes, and seeing how the jiggle goes in the middle. Let me, I'll note that in the recipe notes. Yeah. So 30 to 35 gluten free, 40 to 45 full dairy. Exactly. Okay. Now, if you see the jiggle, jiggle, just a little, little, you want to let it go a little bit more. You're essentially going to be baking it until it is lightly brown and it's set in the center yes. when you do the jiggle. You're going to let it sit for at least 15 minutes to cool and solidify a bit and then cut and serve. You can cut it into pie squares or use a big serving spoon mm-hmm. and kind of put it on a plate that way too. Yeah. I did it both ways. Yep. It is delicious. It says spring and we love it. Send us some pictures. We want to see those Easter brunch tables. We love table settings. We're going to show you ours for sure but definitely send us some pictures. We would love to see it. And tell us if you like it. Okay, so let's move on to retail therapy. Retail therapy. Yeah. Yeah. This week's retail therapy, we're keeping it all eggs because it's Easter extravaganza. And it's the vintage egg cups. We've done this before, but we're doing a little bit more deep dive into it. And there's so many vintage egg cups and new egg cups That are just so cool. Yeah, you want old, you want new, everything in between. We've recently acquired some. I was thinking about this the other day. You owe me some egg cups. I know. I meant to bring it with me today. (laughs) And by the time I got out of the house with the recording equipment. Holly Ann bought some egg cups. No, I didn't buy them. I take that back. Holly Ann got some free egg cups from somebody who was giving them away. It was her aunt's collection. Like on Facebook or something. Yeah, yeah. And you drove like 45, 50 minutes to get these egg cups for Mm -hmm. free. And it was a lot of them. And you're like, Chris, I can't take all these egg cups. And I'm like, I'm never saying no to an egg cup. I have several for you, and I keep forgetting to bring over the box. And I did not think about it even when we were planning this no, episode. No, I did. I did think about it. I had every intention of bringing it with me, and I forgot something. Then the other day, I was like, shoot, I never got those egg cups. So they're super fun to collect. As you know, Holly's going to drive 50 minutes to go get these egg cups. Oh, there were some nice cups in there. <laughs> they're beautiful, they're functional, and they don't take up tons of space. You can put them in a nice collection and show them off in mm-hmm. a nice way, in a nice hutch, Yeah, on a shelf, and they're really easy to put out. You can find them at a variety of price points. They look great on tablescapes. Oh, yeah. And believe it or not, there's even a name for the hobby. What is it? Collecting egg cups is called posillavi, and collectors are posillavists. Really? Sounds like something contagious. But the interesting thing is there are plenty of websites and even some books on the subject. Like collecting egg cups is a thing. I can see that. I mean, first of all, it's a utensil to eat the egg. They're practical and beautiful. Right. So egg cups have been in use for at least a couple thousand years. Some of the earliest known egg cups date to 79 AD. Oh, that's far back. And they were found in the ruins of Pompeii. There were chickens, there were eggs. Right. And you needed something to eat your soft-boiled egg in. I wonder what kind of chickens they had in Pompeii. That's what we need to find out. Legerns. Legerns. They're not as popular here in the U.S., but abroad, they're Um, popular. Canada, Australia, and really the rest of the world, including Europe. Everywhere but here. Like People you say egg cups are like, huh? But egg cups are beginning to get a little bit more popular here. 
I would say so. You can definitely find them. Vintage egg cups that were used more in the past when soft boiled eggs were popular. Mm-hmm. Did your mom make soft boiled eggs? She did not. Mine did. Yeah, yeah. So we never had egg cups because we had the hard boiled eggs all the time. Well, we didn't have egg cups either. My mom would soft boil the egg and then she would just pour them in a shallow bowl or yeah. a plate with a little bit of a rim to it. So you can find egg cups from tons of different makers. You can find them in all different styles and all different materials. Right. You've got ceramic, wood, pewter, glass. And the finest porcelain. And actually, I've seen them in solid silver, too. I've seen them every which way. Yeah. The egg cups range from completely plain to elaborate figural cups. So some are shaped like chickens and roosters. There are intricately painted china cups. This is one of those things we say, take that five-minute vacation Mm -hmm. and look at them. Look at ones from all around the world. Look on Etsy, on eBay. It's not a bad thing to do if you want to start collecting because then you know what to look for. There are some that you wouldn't think are egg cups at first glance. Like some egg cups come attached to a saucer. Right. They have a spot to hold your egg spoon. They have a spot to put the top of the shell. Some of them look like saucers but have just a little indentation in the middle for the egg to sit in. I like them because they're small and you can change them out and pack them up easily. Yeah. And yeah. they're easy to display. Plus, they're useful. Right. If you like soft boiled eggs, they're a must. There are three basic types of egg cups. The single, the double, which is also called the American, and custard cups. They're even bigger. Yes, they are. The single is exactly what it says. It's a small cup with an opening wide enough to hold an egg safely in place. Mm Mm-hmm. It may be footed. It may be figural. I think the ones I have for you have chicks painted on them. Yeah, I think I would. But you have a figural cup. I do. When you were showing me the pictures, I was like, oh, yeah, I like Mm -hmm. those. The double, also known as the American style egg cup, has a larger cup on the top and then a smaller cup on the bottom. Mm -hmm. And often they will be served small side up with the egg on top. Right. You would flip the cup over. Crack the eggshell and pour the soft boiled egg into the larger cup. Exactly. And that way you could dip toast in it. Yes. The third style is the custard cup. It was used essentially the same way, but like you said, it's, bigger. it's a bigger cup. The singles sometimes are just like a tiny tumbler shaped cup. Mm-hmm. I have a couple that are really tiny. For me, I just use them to take a really pretty egg that's laid and display it. I do that too. Put raw eggs on them. Yeah. yeah. Don't always use them to serve. No. Use them as decor too. That would be really cool for the brunch table. You dye your Easter eggs and then each Easter egg cup, you put a different one around for everybody. That would be really cool for a brunch table. You can find them in antique shops and thrift stores, in flea markets, yard sales. And then, of course, you can do Etsy or Mercari or Facebook Marketplace. Facebook Marketplace. All of those places. So some of the makers you can look for. Let's go through it. One of my all-time favorites, Fire King. Love me some Fire King. They make a jadeite double egg cup, which is really cool. That one probably sells for a lot, too. Jadeite is hot and expensive. Yeah. Lefton, my favorite, made a lot of the figural cups for the Japanese export market. Mm -hmm. So you're talking like the little chicks, roosters, all that stuff. And many of the major porcelain companies produce cups. So even like the company that your mom's china was from the 1950s, they might have had egg cups. They went went with with the the sets. Exactly. I have a very old, very tiny pair of single cups in the blue willow pattern. Yeah, you like that blue willow pattern. That's what my china is, blue willow, yeah. There are tons of European made cups and some of them are beautifully painted. I have one that I gave my sister and it wasn't that lot that I got, but she loved it. It was a small German cup and it was painted with a deer on the side. Nice. Yeah, we can get it back for photos. Westmoreland glass. So there are some American producers. Probably most of them are pre-1960. Westmoreland glass did a set that is hobnail milk glass. Okay. And milk glass was also huge in mid-century. Yes. I mean, we're going back in time. I love it. Back to when chicken keeping was what we all did. We're going back and getting all these vintage items and reliving it now. But it's maybe pretty cool. Doing it with better equipment and veterinarians and things to make it easier. And more fun. Yeah. Do you have vintage A cups? Send us some pictures. We would love to see yeah, them. Show off your collections. We want to see them. Yeah. Put them on your brunch table. We want to see those pictures. We just hope everybody has a fantastic Easter. Okay, so should we tell everybody what we're going to be talking about next week? Next week, we are taking a revisit to one of the breeds I absolutely love, the Appenzeller Spitzhaben. Oh, that's fun. And we have a big picture in our studio. A big painting of them, yeah. Yeah. Our main topic, we are interviewing two of the girls from Greenfire Farms. So exciting and fun. It was a great interview. Our recipe, we're giving you something that uses a lot of eggs. Get ready for a Lady Baltimore cake. And it's going to be Sophia's graduation party cake, too. Mm Mm-hmm. 
retail therapy. We're talking about some really cute, really fun metal chicken garden ornaments. Because you want to decorate your yard and your garden and your run with some cool chicken stuff. And you covered all the bases. I did. Okay, so what should we tell everybody to do until next week? Hug your chickens. Every day and kiss them too. We'll talk to you later. Bye-bye. Bye. If you'd like to see more of us, please follow us on Instagram at Coffee with the Chicken Ladies. If you'd like to help us grow the podcast, please leave us a written review on Apple Podcasts. If you'd like to become a patron of the show, please visit our Patreon page, patreon.com slash coffee with the chicken ladies. Thanks for listening.